Welcome to this week's episode of Sussex Sport Weekly Podcast. I'm Matt Powell and this week I'm joined by Brighton and Hove Albion writers Darren Howard and Frankie Elliott and Crawley Town expert Mark Dumford. Brighton's best league season in their 122-year history ending in defeat as the Seagulls went down 2-1 at Aston Villa, who themselves secured European football with a win on Sunday. Uh, Douglas Louise and Ollie Watkins ne- netted for Villa, while Dennis Undav was on the score sheet for Albion. We'll reflect on the game at Villa Park and discuss all the late go- latest goings on at Crawley Town. But first, starting with Sunday, uh, Brighton were unable to end their season on a high, but with European football secured, the result almost seemed irrelevant. Um, you were at Villa Park, Darren, on Sunday. Um, what did you make of Albion's performance? Yeah, it was it was a decent enough performance, but v- Villa are a very good team. They've... Um... You know their their midfield, John McGinn. He, I thought he was very good in in midfield, and then they've got Ollie Watkins as well, and and Louise as well. He's he's a great great player, and the way Unai Emery has them set up is, you know, that they're going to be a, a handful for, um, you know, if they keep progressing and perhaps add a few players, they're they're going to be. Um, uh, I don't think it's a fluke, put it that way, that they're in, you know, such a good position since Emery's taken over. Um, great manager they seem to have some back in as well behind the scenes so so yeah they're, they're going to be very strong next next season I think and for Brighton they they played they played well enough um there's no Lewis Dunk in the team again he's um he's still sort of recovering from his neck and his back injury that he that he's sort of been managing for the last sort of few months um and I think they just rested him so that he can get fit and you know really go for this you know he's got two games for England coming up and his England training camp. So I think they're sort of looking after him and said, look, you've done your bit, um, rest up and then really give everything for the, uh, for the England um, camp that's, that's coming up. So, so yeah, it was one of those strange games really where both sets of fans were quite happy with the, with the outcome. Brighton, yeah. the away fans were, you know, in celebrate, uh, celebrate mood because you know, obviously they've secured a European spot and they've had a great season um and yeah the villa fans obviously pleased as well so to to reach the the yoba conference league so yeah really good atmosphere from both sets of fans and, and a good occasion um yasin ari as well he he played in midfield uh got rare chance to start in the midfield and he looked quite good He's, he was solid enough but as i mentioned the, the villa midfield is very strong so he was up against it so it was a tough one to go into but um, yeah, what I liked, he, he looked, he looked very, he's a very technical player, very skillful, and he's always looking to, to progress as well. So when he gets the ball, he's not just sort of passing sideways. He's, he's clever on the ball, always looking to turn and, uh, and, and start, start attacks moving, which, which I thought, you know, would bode, bode quite well. Uh, Dennis Undav, he was on the score sheet again. So he's got five in his last eight Premier League matches now. So he's, he's finished the season well. And, after you know some criticism earlier in the year, you sort of think, yeah, there's he could be a good Premier League striker as well, uh, going going forward, or certainly you know a vital part of the squad next uh, next season. And Julio and Ciso, he was probably the best player on the day. He played on the left uh, in place of Karen Matoma, who came on in the second half, and and Ciso looked great. He's um, so so good on the ball, and he, he's just so skillful, so determined, and always looking to make something happen. So. So I think there were a lot of positives to come out from it and a good way to end the season, really, even though they, they lost the game. It was a it was a good, good sort of feeling about it. all. Uh, post-match, uh, Roberto De Zerbe admitted he expected influential midfielders Alexis McAllister and Moises Caicedo uh, to leave the MX this summer. Um, De Zerbe was spotted comforting McAllister, who was in floods of tears at full time on Sunday. Um, with the emotional scenes involving the Argentinian widely interpreted as a goodbye, Frankie, um, what do you think McAllister's legacy will be at Brighton and Hove Albion? Well, first and foremost, um, he will be of the Brighton player that won the World Cup. I mean, that is, I know it's not got nothing really anything to do with Brighton, that achievement, but not only is it very rare that a Premier League footballer wins or is part of a World Cup winning team, um, it's almost un- completely unheard of them to be outside the top six. Um, and even if it does happen, it's very rare that they uh, assist in the World Cup final and also score on the run. During they might be normally seen as a squad player or they might be the third choice goalkeeper. He was a key part of that team. So that's an, a phenomenal thing that Brighton fans would always have to say that they had a, once had a player that won the World Cup. Um, so that will be his, his lasting legacy. But 
outside of that, um, I think when you reflect on it in years to come, he will be the best example or one of the best examples of Brighton's amazing recruitment policy, which we know is one of the key factors as to why they've got into Europe this year. You know, he was signed at 20 years old for £5 million from, from Argentina Juniors. Argentinos sent back on loan there uh, and obviously had a loan spell at Boca Juniors as well, which actually in the long run, I think that um, that run in Argentina made him more, he became aware, sorry, he was being made aware to the Argentinian national staff, yeah. national team staff. They were aware of him because Boca Juniors is obviously the biggest club in Argentina. So that run in there, I think they became aware of his talents and that's helped him to be part of that World Cup winning team. Um, but when he came back to Brighton, he had to bide his time. You know, he didn't come down and hit the ground running. He spent, you know, the first two seasons, he only made 19 starts. He was on the bench behind people like Pascal Gross, uh, Basuma, Adam Lallana, Jacob Moda. You know, he really had to, he wasn't, he didn't come in and set the world alight, but he got better. He grew as a player. Um, and then last season, we started to see glimpses of it. I remember the, he put, we started, started a lot more games. He became a regular first team player. I remember the two goals against Everton away from home. That was, a, that was an important victory. Uh, he got the assist for uh, Danny Welbeck's uh, last minute equaliser at Stamford Bridge. And as Brighton grew to becoming a, a top 10 team that season, so did McAllister. Um, and then this season, I have to say the emergence of Moise Caicedo has really uh, helped him shine. They work so well as a pairing and and have become the best central midfield pairing in the Premier League, or one of them uh, being one of the key reasons as to why Brighton got European football this season. Um, and and I think actually, you know, the World Cup win was an amazing thing, but I think he's got better since then. I think um, he's, he's really come on leaps and bounds. He's been used in a more advanced role playing as a number 10. I think he prefers that. He scored more than he scored 12 goals this season. That's a, you know, a great achievement from midfield. I know he scored a lot of penalties, but he's added goals and assists to his game. He really has shown why the big clubs want him. It's not just a case of, oh, he's a World Cup winner. He's a World Cup player and he's a, you know, he's a fantastic footballer. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, this will go down, of course, as the golden age of Brighton's history. You know, this is probably their best ever side. Um, and it's the first time they've played in Europe. And it, when you look, when fans look back in years to come, he will be the first of the three players that are remembered uh, of that side because he was he was that good and he was one of the best. So um, not only will he be remembered as just the player who won the World Cup, he'll also be remembered as Brighton's one of Brighton's best players and their best sides. Um, and also a, when people remind themselves of the way that Brighton moved from a, a League One club to challenging some of you know, Europe's elite within 10 mm-hmm. years, uh, his signing and the way they moulded him and you know, turned him into this player will be a, an example, uh, I'm sure, for years and years to come for other clubs to try and, to try and follow that model. Uh, Frankie's mentioned Caicedo there, Darren. Um, <clears throat> I've seen on social media and as well a few articles on the BBC from Brighton fans calling Moises Caicedo their player of the season. Um, do you think he's been the pick of the Seagulls bunch or are there any other players that you would have picked over the Ecuadorian? I suppose the difficulty you've got there is that so many players have started. It must be hard to pick just one after the season they've had. Yeah, very, very true. It's um, You could make an argument for six, you know, six or seven, maybe, maybe for, for, you know, Brighton players to do it. Um and it's strange, really, that Casido's, you know, had this, he has been brilliant, but he's also, he wanted to leave the club yeah. as well. So it's unusual yeah. to say a player, you know, the fans want this guy as the player of the season who, you know, tried to force his way out of the club halfway halfway through the campaign. But you, you can't ignore what he's done on the pitch. He's he's just so, so good in his position that he plays. He's, he's so powerful. He, just when people think they've got past him, he will... He will sort of manoeuvre his body into sort of these shapes where he can sort of get the ball back and start the attacks going. Um, he he's got, yeah, he he's probably the best player I've seen at, at Brighton um, since since I've started covering the club. I, th- I think he's he's so good. There were worries when Yves Pasuma left. You know how they're gonna you know dominate these midfield areas in in the Premier League, and then Ka- Caicedo has just. Um, taking it by storm is as Frankie was saying about Alexis McAllister it took him probably like 18 months or you know so before we saw him at his best um Caicedo from minute one he's just like my word he's you know he's this he's the real Premier League player straight from the start so so the impact he's had has been fantastic and he's going to be I I feel that McAllister's brilliant and he's going to be tough to replace but but Brighton do have a lot of these technically gifted players who who could perhaps fill the void of McAllister. It won't be easy, but I think he's probably a, a, an easier one to replace than than Caicedo. I think he's going to be very difficult to 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 sort of cover that loss. Um, so 
Yeah, for me, I would probably say he has been a player of the season, even though he wanted, <laughs> even though he wanted to go to Arsenal in January. But also, you look at Lewis Dunk. He's been, he's just gone up another level. He's yeah. Zerbi's. You know, he was great under Graham Potter, Lewis Dunk. But then, Zerbi said, "Look, everything goes through you. Um, you've got to take responsibility. We're going to play this high risk style of football." Um, and Dunk's just taken to it so so well. He's he's. Uh, he's been a leader. He's been a great captain. So any other season, you'd probably say Lewis Dunk could, could be player of the season quite comfortably. Um, I don't think there'd be any arguments if he did. Uh, yeah. Then you've got Pascal Gross as well, Alexis McAllister. Uh, Carol Matoma, he was probably one of my favourite players at the start of the season. He tailed off a little bit towards the end. I just think with the, the amount of games he's played in his first season in the Premier League, plus he was at the World Cup as well. He played a big, big role. So it's been a long old season for for Matoma, as well as Purvis Estupinian. Still struggling with that. <laughs> um, he, he's been great as well in his first full season in the Premier League. But again, he played in the World Cup as well. So they've all played a lot, lots and lots of football. And Estupinian, has, you know, he's been one of those positions that he couldn't afford to get injured. He couldn't afford to take a break because they didn't have another, you know, left back. Even Pascal Gross played left back mm. at Aston Villa. So... Um, so yeah, some some really great performances, and then you've got to give Jason Steele a mention as well. He's he's another one who's come into the to the to the starting lineup. If he'd have played a full season, he could have been in in line for. Uh, but he came in after sort of halfway through or towards um, sort of two a third of the way through uh, for for Rob Sanchez. So a number of great candidates, but for me, it's between Caicedo and Lewis Lewis Dunk. I think. Uh, Darren mentioned there, Frankie, that Brighton might will definitely probably be looking for a replacement for Caicedo. But I think you yourself mentioned of Brighton already got a medi- ready-made replacement in Jakob Murder that we haven't considered, or is the ACL injury that affect him as a player? <clears throat> He's definitely going to feel like a new signing. Um, I mm. think when a player's been out for that long, you do forget what uh, he offered the team. Um, and I think the fact that they haven't rushed him back, I think he's been a sort of training, I wouldn't say available to play, but he's been training for about two yeah. months now. And I think they mm. clearly see that he, what they want to make sure that he's back to his best. And by, by not rushing him, I think they've probably got a better chance of doing that. Um, so yeah, I, it, he will feel like a new signing and that is and that is a good thing to have. But um, yeah, as, as, as Darren alluded to, um, McAllister is, is a fantastic player, um, but not to be too dismissive. Those sort of technically gifted centre midfielders that are good on the board, a good eye for a pass, there, there, there are quite a few of those. Maybe not a, a available to Brighton at that level, but they are, you know, they come around quite often. Whereas a player like Caicedo, he's sort of in that in that N'Golo, uh, N'Golo Kante um, model where it's just like he's very he's irreplaceable um, mm. you know his, his athleticism his ability to break up play his passing get, getting between boxes his energy levels you know they're second to none they re- and he's and he's and he, you know as, as I don't allude to under the press he's brilliant on the half turn exceptional getting out of tight areas so to have all of those qualities being both a being setting as a defensive midfielder but also offering a lot in attack it's very, very difficult to replace. Very, very difficult to replace. And I feel, I do feel for players that come in now like Yasim Ayari and Buonotti because Brighton have been seen as this club that produce players out of nothing. You know, Caicedo was bought for £5 million from a, his hometown club in Ecuador at 19. Players that are bought at that age, I was like, everyone's sort of watching going, oh, give it six months and they'll be, you know, they'll be world class. There's actually quite a lot of pressure for these guys coming in because <laughs> it's now very yeah. well known what Brighton do. Um mm. But I, I just want to add on Kaiseda because I agree with with, with Darren that um, I think he's Brighton's player of the season, also Brighton's best. He will be Brighton's best ever player, um, mm. purely pu- purely for the fact that if you look at the progression where Brighton have come from, because when he came into the side, uh, they had just gone seven games last April. They'd lost six in a row and hadn't won in seven games. They're actually in a bit of a, bit of a pretty bad spell. And that run of games towards the end of the season where they won five of their last eight games and lost just one, which got them into that that ninth position. That first win, that first game, was Caicedo's debut. That 2-1 win against Arsenal, that was his first start for Brighton. And since then, Brighton have gone from strength to strength. Obviously, they've gone from that highest ever place finish to now finishing in Europe this season, FA Cup semi-final, etc., etc. And I, I don't want to put it all down to him. It's not been... But that debut did spark... Mm. You know this 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 surge because he's been he's so brilliant he's so unique um, he's allowed he's allowed other players to flourish as I've said like McAllister um, he's made the team tick um, and it, his 
his, his he will be a massive loss and very very difficult to replace so it's been short and sweet he's only made 53 appearances mm-hmm. for brighton i'm sure fans would say their best ever player would have played for a lot longer someone like lewis dunk but in terms of his level of uh, level of performance uh, week in week out combined with 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 the raw natural talent and skill i don't think there's anyone that's going to be anyone better i think he's going to go on to have an, an amazing career um and mm-hmm. you know the january yeah. thing i think just to finish on that the january thing let's not forget that since that january saga whoever started it whether it was caicedo his agent whatever caused all that drama since then he's still been brilliant He's not. It's not affected his performances. It's not stopped him from playing. He's not moaned. He's not sulked. If he wanted to go, he's still been one of their best players. Um, and as, and in the big games, he's always stood up. So, I can't. It's not. I can't really say a bad word about him. He's been incredible. Uh, do you not think that like, you mentioned it there? The whole January the transfer debacle with Caicedo. Will that ever so slightly tarnish his Brighton career, Frankie? Do you think, or is the way that he's just got on with things? Will Brighton fans forget or forget completely about that, or will that still be that thing in the back of the men mind going? Well, it may be him or his agent were desperate to get out. <clears throat> I yeah, I think. I mean, I the only reason if, if for, for me personally, if I was a fan and and a, and a player was wanting to leave like that and made it so public, um, if I then saw a sort of whinging, moaning, sulking player on the pitch that clearly didn't want to be there, which we see all the time in other Premier League teams. Yes. Um, yes. Then I, then then it would tarnish it. Of course it would. But the fact that we've seen, you know, this... The, I said to give everything. He, he's given everything week in and week out. You know, he played 120 minutes at um, Wembley and then three days later, he was giving his all again against Nottingham Forest and playing the full 90 there. He's never stopped being the, Brighton's best player. And, and, and in fact, I think fans, if you ask every fan what they look for, most they look for, you know, their players to fight on the pitch and give everything. Right. And bar his excellent ability, he's always done that. So I don't think the January, January saga should, you know, we'll never... I. Well, we may may never know who started the the fire that in that that month. But in regards to what what Kaiser mm-hmm. did since and before, should not should not tarnish his legacy. Uh, well, one player who should be sticking around next season uh, is Dennis Undav. Um, and as Darren mentioned, his late scoring uh, late season scoring exploits have kind of flown under the radar. Um, as Darren said, the German has netted five goals in his last eight Premier League matches. Um, it's been a kind of sort of a difficult season for Rundav as he gets up to speed with the league. But has his end of season form indicated that Albion have unearthed yet another gem, Darren? He, he's certainly proven to you know that he's capable of playing at, at this level. Um, it, it's it's very difficult to to say how far he he can actually go. It's um, he can play a, a number of roles. He can play in a ten role. He can play play as a nine as well. And I'd probably say he's he's. Um, at the moment, he's probably Albion's best sort of most nat- as you sort of look at sometimes you say he's a natural finisher. He's probably that for for Albion. He's um he's very sharp in in the box. Lots of little darting movements, and he gets he gets strikes on goal. And he's he's he was prolific in in the Belgium league. And it's mm. it's easy to say oh it's only only the Belgium league, but he's still you know he was knocking in thirty goals plus and. He's found, I think at the beginning, he found the physicality of the Premier League quite tough to to adapt to. Um, you get bashed around, it's fast, and he had to cope. He's, he's apparently, he's one of the strongest guys in the gym now. He's, uh, they say that when he's working out, he's, he's pretty, uh, you know, he can shift a lot of weight. And it's, you can see that now when he plays, he, he's, he, he doesn't seem to get um brushed off the ball um perhaps as much as he he did when he first came in here he looks he looks strong he's and he's he's going to be a very useful player to have especially when games are tight uh and you just need uh someone just to just to create a little bit of magic out of nothing in in a in a box um i think he is that player um how he's whether he's going to play regularly with with, with Evan Ferguson is obviously Danny Welbeck still going to be there. They've got Jao Pedro coming in and CISO can play uh, up top as well. So it, it, there's great competition for, for places, but I think he's really put himself in the mix. His, his end of season form has, has been great. And he, he was probably Albion's, him and CISO are Albion's best players at, at Villa. So, yeah, when you look back earlier in the season, you thought, ah, he's, he, he's not going to, you know, he'll probably end up going out on loan some, somewhere, but um yeah, I think he's um, he's a player that Deserby would want to keep around for for next season, especially when they've, when they've got four competitions next season. So, uh, meanwhile, uh, Brighton forward Katie Robinson has been named in Serena Viegman's twenty-three player England squad for next month's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. Um, 
it's been an incredible season for the 21 year old who received her first senior call up in November 2022. Um, and she's been selected for each international camp since. Uh, Robinson, who has won four caps, will hope to be in the starting lineup for England's Group D games against Haiti, Denmark, and China, respectively. Um, Frankie, uh, how good is it to see Brighton representation in the England squad, and what will she add to uh, Vigman's team? Oh, it's brilliant! It's, it's such a great thing to see. Um, I think it's a it's a fantastic story for Katie because um, two years ago, when she signed for Brighton, she she did her cruciate ligament in at the start of the of the season and missed the whole campaign. Uh, so to have gone from from that, which must have been a, a really you know a massive blow in her career, to two years later representing England at a World Cup, is a phenomenal achievement. And that's all down to her, to her hard work uh, and her commitment to the team. I think her energy levels up front. She's been a shining star in a difficult season for Brighton. Um, you know her, her work, her continuous work rate um, and link up of the play from the midfield is one of her best assets. And, and five goals this season but may not seem like a lot, but it's helped Brighton sustain a semi-final push and also stay in the in the WSL. Um, I think the main reason for her rise as a player, she's playing alongside two. Uh, international players, Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth Turland, the Norwegian striker, and Danielle Carter, who was, used to play for England uh, in her younger years. I think they've done her the world of good. Uh, she's learned a lot from them playing alongside them. Um, and uh, I think being a part of this squad this summer with all the you know, great international players that England now have being a, around Euro winners um, will also mm -hmm. stand her in good stead. I think this is the start of a really uh, blossoming WSL career for Katie and an England career as well. I don't think she's going to play many games at this World Cup and she may not get the many minutes, but the experience will be, will be vital uh, for her. And if she is used, you can imagine it will be in the last 15, 20 minutes to give uh, a slight, a different sort of dynamism to, to England's forward line, because it's going to be a struggle this, this tournament. I know they're coming off the back of that amazing Euros win that we all enjoyed um, last summer, but they're missing a lot of key players. Obviously, Beth Mead, we know about that the injury that she sustained that's keeping her out. They, she was the top goal scorer at the Euro, so there's, that's a huge loss. Um, no, Leah, no Leah Williamson, their captain. Millie Bright, who has been stepping in as the captain, she's not played since March. Lucy Bronze, the right back, one of England's best players, is also recovering from an injury. So it's a bit of a walking wounded team. Um, and there's a, you know, I feel that there's going to be a number of changes during games. So that's why Katie may come in because players may have to be utilised for 50, 60 minutes rather than full games. But it's a pretty comfortable group. Haiti, mm. Denmark and China. Denmark are the only real test in that group, but England will need to or want to come top to avoid Spain in the last 16. Uh, but I have to say, I can't see them you know, matching the achievement of, the, of that year is due to the number of injuries. I think a quarterfinal, semi-final run would be brilliant. A semi-final would be excellent for this team. Um, I think they can, they're still a young team, so they can go again uh, in four years' time. And I think Katie will be a big part of it in four years' time. If, if she continues to play as she did this year for Brighton, you know, I'd, I'd like to re reiterate that playing well in a struggling team really shows how good a player you are. Um, and she has been one of Brian's best players. So I think she continues the way she is in four years time. She'll have an even bigger role to play, whether she's still at, at Brighton or not, but um, an amazing achievement for her and the club and well-deserved. Uh, on the Crawley town front, Mark, you spoke to Crawley boss, Scott Lindsay, who is currently sunning himself in Barbados, I think. Is that right? Is that right for some? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's down, he, he didn't sound too relaxed. I don't think because, um, I think he's still doing a lot of uh, negotiating with players and that, trying to build his squad and that. But he's, uh, yeah, he sounded like he was. Uh, he said it was very sunny out there and he was enjoying it. So yeah, good luck to him. Yeah, Otherwise, good I'm for not him. Bitter at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, as, um, yeah, he, he gave you a very brief update on uh, Crawley squad building, which you can read online at sussexworld.co.uk forward slash sport. But for those who haven't read the piece, Mark, um, how's it looking for the Reds so far? <clears throat> yeah, so they haven't. Apart from the retained and release list, though, they haven't done any business as such yet. So, um, yeah, there's some, there was no real news, but he did say that they were talking, they were talking to players, etc. They've got the three players that they're still in contract talks with: Rafi Khalil, Remy Ote, and Roshan Greensaw. Um, he said he's hoping to have those sorted within the week. So, might be some news on them at the end of this week. But um, yeah, otherwise, he said he, he did say they've got a few players few targets that they're looking at but and they've got to be mindful they need to get things sorted because other clubs will be interested in them mm. but uh yeah but they i think it's a case of they need, will need to move players on from the squad because they have got quite a large they got i think we said 21 i think there's 21 yeah. players currently 
in the squad, and that's a, a lot for a, for a manager who obviously wants to change some things. So he's got to get rid of a few before he um before he brings any in. I think. Uh, do you think Crawley fans are expecting the club to have like a sell to buy policy this summer? And um, Wagner United, they certainly made a splash by bringing in 2021-22's top league two goal scorer Don Telford to the club. So is it a surprise to see the owners rein in the spendings a bit and tighten the purse strings? Yeah, I think it is a little bit because um, I don't know if because obviously last year they had the NFT uh, sale that brought in quite a, a few million for the club. Um, hmm. Whether that sort of they're predicting less so less money this year, I don't know, but yeah, I think it would be. I think they def they definitely need to bring in three or four new players. They need to they need a striker to support yeah. Telford. They need a couple of more in midfield because obviously they brought in a sort of emergency Jordan Much and Anthony Grant this year. Um, they've both been released, so they definitely need someone else to support the likes of Jack Powell, um, Ben Gladwin, etc. in midfield, and then maybe a couple of defenders um, and another goalkeeper because we don't know. Roshan Greensall never made a first team appearance for Crawley, so mm. nobody knows actually how good he is, but he has been there at the club for a couple of years now. So, uh, yeah, but um, I mean, looking at the squad, you've, you'd look, you'd think the likes of Tony Craig, Jake Hesentyler, Kwesi Appiah, I'm convinced they're going to be leaving anytime soon. I think it's just a case of negotiating. They're under contract. Um, they all went out on loan uh, this year. Um, so I imagine that's three players he's getting out of his squad. And then you look at the likes of Jaden Davis, Florian Castrati, who both went out on loan to Ishmael League clubs, uh, Brightling Sea Region, I think um, Davis went to, and Bogner Castrati yeah. went to. Whether those are players that um, Scott Lindsay thinks that can do something for them next year, I don't know. I think he will want a bit more experience and a bit more depth than that. Um, Jaden Davis did okay last year, I thought, when he did play, but he wasn't, I don't know, maybe he just wasn't consistent enough for Lindsay in the training sessions and that, who knows. But, um, yeah, so I'd, I'd, I reckon there's probably four players that we will see leave, and that gives Lindsay room to maybe get bring in five or six. So, and you, what, meant, you, that... you mentioned, oh, sorry, Mark, go on. No, carry on, no, you carry on. I was going to say, you mentioned experienced players there and Craig, Hassenthaler and Apai are all experienced. Can you see there being no way back for them? Is that... Um, I don't you know. Just, it, just just what happened with, obviously, Tom Nichols, Glenn Morris and... Um, George uh, Franken. George Franken, thank you very much. Um, they, all, they all left the club and they're part of that group um, hmm. that the, the owners, when we were kept asking, why aren't they being selected before they were sent out on loan? Um, and it was sensitive legal issues. So we don't know the detail of that. Uh, I just, yeah. And if Lindsay wanted them, he strikes me as the kind of character that would have said, no, I need these players in my team, especially with the run that they had at the end of the year, which was very important of surviving in League Two. So if he wanted them, I think he will... Uh, he would have not sent them out on loan and he would they would have been part of his team. So I imagine it's just a case of negotiations of paying out the contracts, etc. and that. But um who knows? Crawley Town surprised me every year with what they do, so <laughs> they could, you could do. But um I think the kick obviously keeping Rafi Khalil and Remy Oti, that'll add another two to that twenty one. So that suddenly becomes twenty three. So yeah. I, I think he'll be looking to get rid of three or four of that that 23 so he can bring in four or five new players mm. uh, well off the pitch uh crawley town have frozen their season ticket prices um after a big increase in attendance last season um good news for the fans that they've frozen prices ahead of the new campaign mark <laughs> yeah and i think yeah they have the fans have welcomed this because it was quite a big thing last year when i when i went to the first fans forum fans were asking what are you going to do about season tickets i can't afford it and that so they lowered it straight away. They lowered um the prices, I think, by 34%. And oh. incredibly, the average attendance were increased by 34% this year. So, <laughs> I mean, anyone who can do math says that's a pretty good business they did there. So, um, so yeah, the average attendance rose from 2,277 to 3,044. I mean, the last time they had average attendances like that was obviously when Steve Evans was here and they were playing at Old Trafford winning league two going up to league one and that so it's um great uh 
Sorry, England have just got a wicket. That's why I was slightly distracted yeah. there. Jack Leach. Jack Leach getting rid of Paul Sterling. Caught behind. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, it's really good. And that that's where I'm Wagmi have got a huge amount of criticism and in some aspects probably deserved. But one thing they have done is they've increased attendance. Is they've made the match day experience better. They've got the, the red zone at the ground. They've brought in food trucks to make it a bit more like the tailgating thing they do in America. Um, and that has worked. So, yeah, so it's um, really good to see. And I think it was the second or third biggest increase in average attendance in League Two for any club as well this oh, year. Really? So despite how bad the season was in terms of results and position in the league, <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That, that's a pretty good result. And if they're getting, especially if they're getting youngsters through the door, because they're not a legacy fan club, they need to bring new people in to support them. Um I think, yeah, I think that's one thing they've done really well. And it's great to see them because that hopefully will only increase this year. And if results improve, then you'd imagine attendances would improve as well. Hmm. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you very much, chaps. Um, any other business that you can think of? Well, I, I, I think we should talk. Oh, sorry. Carry on. Sorry, carry I was going to mention Levi Colwell. There's uh, that sort of yeah. bet came on this morning that Brighton of. Uh, Supposedly bid thirty million for him from from Chelsea. I think I think that would be a great deal if they can get that through. Um, he's he's been very you know really impressive for Brighton this season. I, I think he's a future England international to, to be honest. So if, if they can get that deal done, I think is um, that would be great for Brighton. Although Chelsea, what's going to happen there? It's anybody's guess. It's all a bit. A bit okay. Bring back Jose. That's what I say. <laughs> Did anyone watch last night's Europa League final? I did. I gave I, it. I sent a tweet out just saying that Brighton have nothing to fear. If that's the best of the Europa League, then they can <laughs> Brighton can really, you know, have to achieve something quite quite amazing if you know that they Brighton should be able to hold their own against those, I thought. 120 minutes of my life I'm not getting back. I feel robbed. <laughs> yeah, just like, I'm, I'm wearing uh my um, one of my umpiring tops here. Can I just say, um Anthony Taylor, what a game he had. I thought he was yes, absolutely yes, yes. superb mm. last night. Yeah, I thought he was great. Crit referees get criticised all the time. VAR gets criticised. I mean, to call encroachment in a penalty shootout at that point was brave. a very brave, de brave decision, mm. but the right decision. So, um, yeah, no, just for you. Deserves a shout out. Up to officials. Come on. We're the best. Well, especially yeah. considering how, in, well, uh, Steve McManaman kept on using the word embarrassing, but it was a bit much, I think, the way that Seville and Roma's Technical areas were constantly haranguing him. He probably yeah. delighted that that game finished because it not a great spectacle, yeah. but there you go. <clears throat> Absolutely. So yeah, um, thank you very much, chaps. Um, you can catch up with all the latest sports news covering everything we've talked about here at sussexworld.co.uk forward slash sport. Uh, thank you very much for your time as ever, and uh, we will see you all uh, next week. Cheers, guys.